another intro starting. Hang on. <laughs> Oh my god, okay, that's I don't know what's going on guys. Hello, welcome, we're live and Bernie's not here and I'm on a farm and having issues with my my um, internet. So welcome everyone, we've got Matt from Cultivate Elevate. Um, so all the links for his channel you'll find below, go across and check him out. He's only a couple of months uh, on YouTube and he's up to 20k, so um, he's doing good stuff and Basically, you're you're going down the electroculture um, kind of path. Welcome, Bernie. We're live. We couldn't wait for you. And I tried to do a long intro, and I stuffed it up. So, oh, good. Welcome, I was Bernie. watching. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, yes, this one's been in the works for a while, but then also happened kind of spontaneously. So I do have another video premiering currently uh, right now on my channel, and then I'm also going live with Ben Balderson. Uh, right after this episode, oh gosh, but really? it's perfect, and I've been uh, trying to get this going because Matt, you're doing absolutely epic work. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of any of my my own stuff with the year of the coil and whatnot, but uh, Jeremiah and Gerald also have been doing a lot of this uh, steps into electroculture. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I've, I, I haven't seen your your work with the with the coils that you've been doing, but with the electroculture, yeah, it's been going nuts. Um, people's gardens have been going crazy. People have been yielding more food than ever, and uh, I think it's going to be a, an epic year. And today's the full moon, or partially into today is the full moon, so you got a lot of energy going on. And we have four super moons and the eleven year solar cycle going on, so it's going to be a it's going to be a crazy year of a lot of food. A lot of energy and a lot of things happening all at once, which sounds like what's going on with your day today. A lot of things at once. <laughs> That's interesting because that, what they're trying to tell us at the moment in in the in the clown show is, you know, there's going to be scarcity, aren't they? And you're sort of saying if we all get on and do it ourselves, then there's going to be abundance. Yeah, because what happens is is the the moon energy and the sun energy, both of those, help increase yields tremendously. Right. So if we combine that with electroculture, we would have the most we might have the most abundant year of in, in a really long time. Right. Because wow. of just the increase of both of those, you have four super moons this summertime. Right. And every time you have a super moon, it pulls the plants and makes the sprouting increase faster and basically pulls on the earth. Right. Pulling up the, the plants and making them taller and increasing the energy. And then we have all the stuff going on with the sun which is sending out a large amount of UVs and radiation and all that beautifulness as well. So now you're increasing plant growth during that time as well. So with all the stuff we've been being programmed with or shown with the, you know, scarcity, 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 we actually could have abundance and more abundance than ever this year specifically because of all of the energy, the cosmic energy, I guess you would call it, that's going on during this time. Nice. So just for um, anyone who doesn't sort of know your work or doesn't know what we're talking about, do you want to give a brief explanation on what electroculture is? Yeah. So what, what, what electroculture is, is you're basically placing wood and copper antennas. That's the easiest way to do it. You can take a piece of wood, wrap it with a piece of copper and place it into your garden. You can make big ones. You can make little ones. You can make toothpicks wrapped in copper. You can, you know, to help your sprouting, you can do it in just about anything. But what you're doing is you're harnessing the atmospheric antenna, or I'm sorry, the atmospheric energy that's all around us, right? You look at these old world buildings that used to have antennas all over them. Those were harnessing the atmospheric energy that's all around us. And when you're placing these antennas into your soil or into your garden, to your farm, to your indoor plants, to your basement, wherever it may be, you're starting to harness that atmospheric energy. And you'll start to notice that your plants will start growing faster. They'll start uh, becoming more frost resistant, heat resistant. They'll not need as much water, right? The soil will actually function the way it's supposed to, so they won't need as much water. And then the other magical thing is with the your, with the plants, you're helping to you're helping to boost the sap of the plants, right? The sap is the blood of the plants, and these antennas can help boost all the plants in which 
that are that you're planting so that you start to increase the sap and the, the the way that the i'm oh, sorry you let me start all over you're helping the sap of the plants which is the blood of the plants you're you're helping it move right a lot of our plants are very stagnant they're the trees and everything like you see one side of a tree looks like it's not doing so well and you see the other side of the tree it's doing very well reason being is the sap is flowing on this side the electrical conductivity is flowing on this side this side it's turned off so when you're placing these copper antennas into your soil you're turning back on the electrical conductivity of the earth and your gardens your farms and everything around you and this was all discovered back in the 1910s 20s and 30s and 40s when three different people were showing this which were justin christo flo victor schauberger and george lakowski they were all the kings of electroculture at that time because they were doing all these different experiments and showing all these beautiful results and getting just tremendous results for all different types of plants but this information was forgotten over time and it's you know i, I always talk about this because World War II was a reset, right? A lot of this information yeah. was lost during World War II. And when it came to the natural ways of being connected to our earth, that was lost during that time because chemical farming took its place. You know, we spray yeah. all these toxic chemicals on our food and then expect it to be healthy. It doesn't make any sense. So a lot of the information related to electric culture at that time was lost because of the after post-World War II and a lot of these books, there's only a couple. There's actually only about like about five or six out there that I've seen. But a lot of the books are very hard to find as well, too, which because they were getting rid of that information during that time so that people would become dependent on either a grocery store or going to the hardware store and buying all those pesticides and spraying them all over their foods so that their soil doesn't work too well. Their plants don't grow. And where do they go back to? The grocery store. And you just have this yep. perpetual loop. Yep, yep. Um, and thank you to Dave's Waffle, Waffle House for your support. And someone asked, um, does it would it work if the copper was in the ground, or does it, does it actually have to be an antenna that's pointing upwards? So you'd want to place the copper into the soil so that it's kind of like it's grounding, and then you want to yep. place the other part of the copper up into the air pointing towards the north. Right. So it's literally draw, drawing down into the ground. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Cool. And um, as you mentioned, you know, we, we obviously look into a lot of these old buildings and spires and and this podcast was pretty much started around that and the whole sort of free energy and what's what is it all. And um, you show you've shown a picture of is it Ohio uh, World's Fair where they have um, an Eiffel Tower and you suggested that maybe that's a mega antenna for electroculture. Yes. So when I was researching into that, I I was realizing that, and I'm sure you've done the research as well, but that the Eiffel Tower used to be everywhere, right? Like all yeah. over every part of the world, you know? Yeah. So I thought, well, let's say if you... Still a couple in Asia too, right? Like in uh, Japan and China, I believe. Yes. And then they've built another Eiffel Tower in Vegas. Like they have excuses to build the replicas and they still, they're building them replicas. now everywhere again. Sorry to interject. <laughs> oh, you're right and then it has become yeah a replica it's it's nothing close to what it actually was but yeah they were found all over and i thought about it you know with all these different antennas that used to be on top of the buildings those were always the first things they took off the buildings right they when they're doing all this you know remodeling they always take off the antennas and it always made me think about that but yeah, I, I would think they would be one gigantic antenna. And if you had, for example, any substances up there, like mercury, you know, or something that can create a spin or anything related to that, you could be just harnessing the atmospheric energy, which is stuff that they were doing in the 1900s. They used to send balloons up into the air, connect a, a, a copper wire to them, and they would yep. harness the atmospheric energy. So those Eiffel Towers could be used in the same fashion for that area. Because if you had a gigantic spire, like you were saying, it could be covering a very large area instead of just obviously a piece of wood and a piece of copper. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, we see all these, you know, palaces, you know, they call them with these massive gardens that are all, um, you know, they're all full of, you know, geometric shapes and fractal shapes and all this sort of sacred geometry and stuff. Do you, now, and of course, they don't grow food in them now. They're like just these gardens, right? But I've always 
sort of um, theorised that they were probably where they were growing the food just because of the fractal nature of how it all is. It looks like like they're drawing in energy. What, what are your thoughts on that? Do you so a lot of the, old, the, the sacred buildings, the cathedrals, the mosques, the temples, the churches, all of those things, they usually had an antenna on top. And then there was a copper wire that was connected to that antenna, which led down the building into the garden that was right next door. So if you think about it, they were doing electroculture this whole time without really telling us. And see, this is the thing I've been wondering since I've been watching your stuff is, you know, we've been going along the the um, free energy as far as they're drawing it down and then turning it into electrical energy that's usable. Um do you think they were doing both or do you think mo that it was mainly electroculture that, that, you know, that they were putting it into the ground? I think it was mainly the electroculture because I've seen the wires down for. Yeah. Example, so have I. Yeah. And connected into the garden. And the other thing too, is if you think of the shapes that they use with the garden, those also create energy, right? So if they're using yes. triangles, squares, and different types of sacred geometry, they're creating energy, you know, points, right. All over their garden as well too. So, I think it was mainly electroculture for that one. Um, if we went into the free energy, you can use the water and mercury and other things. But I think primarily for those gardens, they understood it. And the way buildings are built, like, for example, let's just go with like cathedrals, right? They always usually face to the east, right? Because there's the least amount of energy in the east. And that was something else I learned that was interesting. They understood that north to south is always the highest amount of energy. And then okay. people would sit in the West, right? And there would be a lot of energy over there, but the least amount of energy was always to the East. And Philip Callahan had some great work on this where he showed when he was planting like um, a bunch of different uh, plants that all the plants that were planted to the East actually were the tiniest while all the ones planted to the North, South, and then over to the, the Southwest as well were all the largest. And a lot of those cathedrals are all facing certain directions and then understanding how to harness that atmospheric energy. You're making so much sense of a lot of this antiquitech. And another major one is pyramids. And now you have me thinking, is that also why the pyramids are arranged to the cardinal points uh, for directing that energy too? And that uh, there's been a lot of research both in uh, Russia more recently as well as some down in Mexico now that a lot of the South American pyramids were used for uh, agriculture as well, essentially this electroculture. I could totally see that because if you look at the work of like Les Brown and all of his work, he had some great work with pyramids. And he showed that if you take, for example, seeds and you place them in a pyramid, they will sprout like 300 times faster, 300 times bigger, the plant will be just a whole different plant when you go to put it into the earth. And then on top of that, you could preserve things in the pyramids too, right? So if somebody took food and put it in a pyramid, they can actually preserve it without using a fridge, right? So that eliminates the whole refrigeration that we use in this whole system with LED lights and all kinds of weird stuff. So that was the one part of the pyramid. And then what I also saw with what you were just describing with the Russians, when they started putting their fiberglass pyramids all over and they're building all kinds of ones. Like, I mean, it's wild the amount of things happening in Russia, but yeah, they're doing fiberglass pyramids and they started noticing that everywhere that they placed a fiberglass pyramid, that whole area was having plants that haven't been there for 20 or 30 years, come back to life and start growing and be wow. all over the place. So yeah, when you really look at it, these things were placed on certain points because they understood they could amplify that energy or reflect the energy. Because now I kind of think of things in reflections. Okay, that makes sense. And these are fiberglass pyramids, so it's clearly it's just the the geometry that's creating the field. Not it's no metals or anything. It's the geometry, right? Yes, just the just the simple shape of the pyramid, right? Because you're creating just points which are then creating vortexes, right? And then that's basically what's occurring at that same time. But then they start to understand, as somebody just said, a pyramid scheme. But uh, what do I call it? And then they start to understand, you know, that all of these different angles can make a difference based on certain things. And then if we think of, like, the reflective purposes of certain angles, 
then you could think of how you could maybe change energy like the wavelengths, right? Like if everything is in a wave, just to make it simple, then, you know, maybe you could, based on a certain angle, change the reflective way that the energy is bouncing back and then it gotcha. would yes. reflect onto that area. That, that, that makes sense. Because, yeah, it just changes the frequency of the wave but the, off the angle of the pyramid. Yeah, right. That's that's very interesting. So, I mean, we have all these pyramids and we were looking recently at, at the Nubian pyramids and they're, compl they're, they're like the big pointy ones that are more like the, what yeah, they're like building in Russia. Eight or 77 degrees, I believe. 70, around there, yeah, 77, 76 degrees. Um, oh. uh, welcome, Gerald. I've got uh, – I invited Gerald, our other – uh, electroculturist that has some results to share, but please continue, Matt, first uh, with the, everything you're explaining, Campbell. And that's um, the other thing, too, is, you know, with the, the Nubian pyramids were at 76 degrees, and then they also used certain type of materials, right? They used paramagnetic and non-magnetic uh, materials together, which would amplify okay. the energy, you know? So the yeah. thing is, is, a lot of those were also built out of quartz, Right. And what and, happened? Uh, Mica as well was reported uh, covering the ones in um, Teotihuacan, yeah. I believe, in Mexico. Oh, yeah. There, which so is another. Uh, so that essentially uh, makes them a capacitor, right? If they're using different materials. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And that was the, uh, I was going to say, the work of Philip Callahan. He showed that with the Celtic round towers, that they were Sorry. more of communicators or communi co communicating buildings that could be used for communication or to be used to levitate, which was interesting because during the full moon, like cer certainly like right now, right? You can actually cause your body to go into levitation if you're inside of these buildings because you can change the magnetism of your blood based on meditation and you can cause your body to levitate. And a lot of people are levitating and floating around and you know how they always say like all the stuff with witches and witchery yeah and, and the yogis and like uh the monks and stuff like that they all still have these uh legends and the videos even of them that supposedly they're like a couple hundred years old and just like sitting there in their uh yoga cross and floating uh, before we continue though matt uh and jill now that you're both here uh, if you did want to stream it to your channels, uh, you, it's not going yet, so you'd have to hit it. Uh, but oh, we got I, I'm still back. trying to set mine up, but for some reason, uh, Streamyard won't email me back. So I got to figure that out. Still. We, we can send you. We can send you the video yeah. anyway. We'll send you yeah. the video, and you can put it up on your channels later. I just wanted to say, Matt, you've inspired me. I've been watching you for a while. You're the one that actually got me to dig deeper and find. Uh, uh, I believe it's Justin Christ the Flow. I could be getting his first name wrong, but amazing book, amazing tech, and uh, you know, thank you for your work. I just wanted to say that. I'm happy to put it out there. And yes, that was Justin Christo Flow, one of the first Christo. people and pioneers in electroculture. And you know, his only book was actually in an Australian library. That was mm, that's where that wow. PDF comes from. Somebody wow. in Australia uploaded that book. And that's where it actually all kind of kept going. Because if that PDF was never released on onto the internet, then I mean, most Nobody. of us don't even know about any of the work of, of his work or any of the things in which he was doing. Because his book, I think, honestly, I think they just burned it and suppressed it so that they just nobody could figure it out because they needed to push DuPont, you know, and all the chemical companies and all of those people yeah. at that time. But I'm happy you're taking the, uh, initiative to learn about it and try it and just see that anything's everything's energy you know it's that's that's Absolutely. what it is mm. yeah i work with geometrical electromagnetic coils and i've been doing lots of tests on plants lately i uh, got a, lo a lot of video that's going to be released in the near future but things are growing extraordinarily fast and seeds i don't know about 300 percent. i kind of made a mistake uh, I did an experiment with seeds and it's on my channel, but my, where I had stored them was a little bit too cold and they were growing too slow. So I tried to warm them up and unfortunately forgot them where, where I had warmed them up and cooked them. So I'm going to redo the experiment on the seeds, but the plants that I have growing <coughs> in my grow room are just beautiful right now. And that's all from pulsing electromagnetics. 
I'm I've done a control and now the pulsing electromagnetic uh, growth is being done. So it's it's interesting. It's interesting. So sorry, are you are you pulsing like sending electromagnetic waves across the plants rather than using antennas? Well, the way that this coil works is I can split the south field in the middle of the coil and it goes south up north down like but north i can down. extend them so what i've got is i've got galvanized wire that goes in the center of the coil and it goes all the way down to the floor and it reaches to the bottom of each pot where i'm growing and then the coil itself sits in the middle of the room and i pulse it three times a day wow. so that i've got the north side down basically in the galvanized steel and the south side up and I would reverse the experiment later and do the north side up and south side down just to show the difference. So, but I put the so whole you haven't done that yet? Part, no, I'm, I'm just pulsing right now. I'm pulsing the south side up oh, and the north wow. side's connected to the galvanized steel that's underneath each pot plant. It's not weed that I'm growing, but the pot of the plant. And then, um, yeah, and I built the whole grow room and I've got the cameras all set up in there and it's been you know taking a video here and there so it's interesting i'm very very excited to show the results but i have to wait until it's all complete otherwise i'm just tooting a horn that may not be <laughs> yes yeah, awesome. you're, you're not being scientific yeah exactly so i'm trying to do it as yeah. as, as scientific as possible yeah. i like that that reminds me of uh dorothy redelac and the bird sounds and that's what she, that's what they did with the music. They would play music like classical music or Bach or Beethoven for oh, about wow. usually ten to fifteen minutes, you know, upwards to an hour. And mm -hmm. the, the plants would just accelerate during that time. And then you had Dan Carlson with the Sonic Bloom, which was the same thing where he played a boombox for about I think it was like forty five minutes or an hour. And then he would spray fermented. Uh, a, a, like a, a, a wine juice on his plants while he did that. And he noticed that every time he would play the music and then spray the plants at the same time, it would actually cause the stomatas to open up and they would absorb wow. that instantaneously and it would accelerate the growth. So it's interesting because when we look at everything we do currently today, all the stuff we spray actually does the opposite. It, mm. it blocks it all up, but your, mm. what you're doing is using those frequencies to to open things up instead of closing them down and then, yeah. you know, destructing the plants, what they're doing basically. I, I don't know if you know what hybrid There's vigor scarcity. is. Yeah, <laughs> scarcity, yes. I, I don't know if you guys know what hybrid vigor is. It's it's usually a term used with growing marijuana, but I yes. see it. Yeah, but I see it with, with the carrots that I'm growing and all the leaves go into hybrid vigor. They're all pitched at an angle after pulsing. It's it's interesting, and I've I've got that on film that'll be shared later. But yeah, so they stand up more like like a, a natural antenna almost. Almost think of the leaves. Normally they'll they'll sit like at a level pace or, or slightly drooped, right? But after mm. pulsing, all the leaves sort of pitch upwards. And yeah. when you're looking at a marijuana plant, that's called hybrid vigor. It, it's basically reaching for your light. It's reaching for for the energy that's above it. So I believe that's the same sort of mechanism. Maybe not the right term, though. I like that. Mm. Reminds me of all the, the towers that they're putting all over the place and how those impact the same thing. Like you said, they're just they're destroying the cells, the, the cellular health or the hydration of the plant. And mm -hmm. then it's causing it to droop and then also fall apart. You know, yep. so it reminds me exactly of that. And then you're now boosting that back, sending it back. Right. And then now that plant is just going up and it's it, it's showing its its presence right it's it almost has like pride that plant has pride yeah. like it's, it's showing it's it's you know it's here versus these plants mm -hmm. that are just kind of drooping and kind of falling apart over time yeah it's almost yeah, it's just like us right it's right. just like humans you can see a happy healthy human you know who's confident you know they'll look a lot different to someone who's like oh my god the world hates me it's <laughs> pretty much we can all go through those moments of the world hating me, but, uh, you know, it's a moment. <laughs> it, is. it is. It is. Yeah. And it's all just a show. <laughs> yeah. And that's the other thing, too, is like related to the scarcity. Like we were talking about it when you first we first started this 
it's like you they're just it's 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 creating that right it's creating the mm -hmm. mindset of scarcity yes. but meanwhile like even your little experiments in your house yep. are going nuts you know so now imagine this on a large scale you know let's say a million people doing it or even 10 million or even just a city doing it right you could have so much food like there's no scarcity at all that's for sure you know it's it's far from that but it's always that programming to get us into that frequency and then you know everything's mm. on but it's not yeah. everything's beautiful Mm, I mean, it's crazy. Everyone, you know, there's all this talk about going into the age of Aquarius and, you know, clearly there's something going on, right? Um, and the age of Aquarius is supposed to be more about, you know, abundance, right? And 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 it's also connected to the to the ether, right? Which would be ether energy. And mm -hmm. um, but all we get on the on the propaganda box is the opposite. Oh, no, we're going into everything's clap. We're going into scarcity, no money, no food. All the farms are being burnt. All the chickens are being killed, all this kind of stuff. And I really? guess in the end, if we just make the decision, well, that's, that's the system and who cares? Let's just grow our own food. Well, it doesn't have any effect on us, does it? No. Right? Because what, what we don't have anymore is food security. It's like you were saying before, Matt, it's they take away all these you know, skills of growing your own plant and you end up being yeah. um, you know, dependent on, on the supermarket and then the supermarket just decides to put you know, eggs from three dollars to twelve, and what do you do? You, you know, you can't really go and barter with them. So, but if you've got chickens, who cares? Yeah. Right? Yep. And that that was what led me a lot into electroculture was learning about all the Victor Schauberger's work and how the government at that time in the 1940s petitioned against all of his work related to copper, brass, and bronze, yeah. and and did different scares on the media, on the newspaper, and on the radio saying that if you use copper tools, you'll grow too much food and not too make much money, you know? I don't so, get, like, how, uh, I've heard you say that. How did, like, how, how did they get that? You'll grow too much and that, that means you won't make money. How, do, how does that even work? I think, I, I, I was going to say, the, I think it was just the, uh, the publication, the way it was written. And then maybe people thought, oh, well, maybe the prices will get changed. Okay, so they'll be like, too much food and so you won't get as much for it and all this kind of stuff and yeah more people were farmers back then and that it's with yeah. this electroculture technology the structured water all of these different lost ancient alchemical practices technologies that we could essentially be extending our lives a lot more and yep. that it's bringing back to our own control and that it, we society had been structured and manipulated to give up all the control give up all of uh, our self-sufficiencies and our free will to rely on that machine and now it's the whether you want to go with the great reset or if you want to go with the great awakening and with the great awakening you take your control back you lead by example and you start uh, to get this abundance back the artificial scarcity just suddenly disappears and if you couple all that with uh, worm castings and, and natural fertilizers and you're able to do it on kind of a, like this summer, I'm trying for a one acre scale of pulsing electromagnetics for a big garden just to see how much it's going to produce. Um, I wanted to go back to what Matt said for a second about Victor Schauberger. Do you remember the shape of his uh hand till it was um it's yes. shaped almost circular and into itself and when like you're pushing it yeah. Dirt, yeah it it literally turns the dirt like this and it stops microorganisms from being destroyed by uh the shape of a regular hoe so to speak and it's made out of copper i don't yes, know if sir. you've ever seen it it was called the bio plow that was yes his, the uh, bio plow Schauberger bio plow and it was it was mimicking nature. It was mimicking the way a mole and a shark cuts through the water and the earth. And it would wow. spin the soil instead of driving in straight lines. Because when you look at Victor Schauberger's work and everything in which he said in all of his books and everything, is that we build in straight lines, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Because everything in nature is curving. Right. And he even said our planting, like we, we plant in straight lines, which doesn't make any sense because everything is curving when it's growing together and, and, and harmonized together. And he showed with that bio plow how you could just cut right through the earth 
really easily and you don't have to yep. use as much work, right? And he even showed too with copper shovels versus iron shovels, how a copper shovel will just slide right in the earth. You don't have to do as much work. Yep. And an iron shovel, you got to jump on it and kick it and try to get into the earth because of Absolutely. The, the magnetics, obviously. It's magnetic, from yeah, it's resistant. Yeah. That's yeah. So it's it's just, amazing. It's wild, like all of his work yep. and everything. And yeah, Schauberger was uh, a genius when it came to that. And that's why even when you look at his inventions and all of the stuff he was talking about, he was saying if we use that energy, we could be creating devices that spin and they would mm -hmm. create energy and we wouldn't have to use these like, for example, automob automobiles that are only 13% efficient, right? Because yeah. he even said yeah, like our engine is 13% efficient. He's like, we could have free energy <laughs> that's 100% the whole time spinning, but we're doing this stuff all backwards. I'm working yeah. on free energy stuff right now. So I, I kind of, I, I know the gist about, about all that. I just finished my alternator generator that kind of, I won't say it runs itself because that would be wrong, but three, um, there's three alternators on it. One motor runs the system and I'm producing 370 amps, 12 volt that goes into a battery bank and the third alternator charges the 48 volt battery bank that runs the system so oh. i won't say it runs itself but it's very efficient it's a closed all system pretty much is it yeah yeah yep. yep. have you so. ever seen john keely's work yes love yeah, john keely. you could mimic that and use that yeah. and there you go that's that bio plow right there that beautiful thing you know the scientific community that bernie and everybody has kind of gotten together here I believe can build that plow and I'm going to attempt to my very best to somehow pull guys together to construct that. Cause that is an amazing system. Heck yeah. It's so cool. Right? What, like, what like is, that. what are the, what would like, is copper more expensive than, I mean, I'm not sure how much more, but what's the price difference between uh, that if, or yeah. if it was made with steel? Not it's much. Not, like not much. No, cool. and no, I'm thinking copper would be easier to work with than, than steel. The prototype will cost you a bit of cash because you're looking at by the looks of things that looks like a maybe a quarter inch. You could do yep. it out of brass, but I believe copper is going to work better. Better, so and That's shout out main. to my mom who posted that link on Facebook for me and is watching. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, shout oh. out to Bernie's mom. But in the, yeah, that's so. Like, I was gonna say, if you see that design to it, it's mimicking nature, the curves. Mm. You know, yep. it's not in a straight. Just, I mean, it's kind of like if if all of us went on a run, like right now, and we all took a, a straight pipe and held it behind us and tried to run. You know, we're not going to be able to run too far. Like it's, it's, <laughs> you know, it's just the comment, the the looking at it it's in the common way. The dirt. This would cut right through the dirt. Right, the vortex. Yep. Yeah, and I've looked at it. It's very interesting how the dirt comes in and it gets stopped and then it turns around <laughs> on itself. Yes. So it, it's amazing. It, it's literally a torus, right? It's um, Exactly. It's, it's, well, it creates the torus uh, motion. It creates a torus effect of the outside to in and then exactly. inside to out. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not, I don't know if it's a torus. It's very strange. I don't know what you would call it. It's not quite a torus. It's not quite, yeah. This reminds me of what, I was going to say, this reminds me of what Victor Schauberger said about the, the fish and how the fish levitate up the stream. Because yeah. when the fins are going like this, they're creating multiple vortexes, right, to make them levitate up the stream. So same mm -hmm. thing with that. If you think about it, the soil, like you just said, is going both directions at the same time, but spinning. Yeah. So you're creating your, your you, you know, your, your, your vort. I mean, you're, you're vortexing your soil while it moves through, right? It's like it's it's probably the yep. best of both worlds. Or structuring, if we were to take it into structure, you're keeping the structure intact. Yeah, you're allowing the microorganisms to stay intact because all you're doing is moving them. You're not actually cutting through them, so to speak. Pretty much. Yeah, no, that's a good point, actually, Joe. And the iron, it, mm. it, it would seem like it, it almost grounds out the charge in some way, whereas the copper would move through the charge in the soil. So right. it almost act like a. That's what. Like, 
Go ahead. Between the iron and the copper, like going into the ground shovel, like it, that's what my mind set on is like it freezes it or like sticks it together as opposed to separating it because of the charge in the fields. And uh, very similar, like putting a magnet through copper and you see how it uh, changes stuff that the earth, I guess, is uh similar with its electric field i i believe matt brought it up uh in one of his videos prior it had to do with the elements in the soil i believe you said i think it was something to that when the iron's going into the soil it's diminishing the magnetism or the, the life force of the of the soil so it makes it really hard to work with and it clumps it all up and blocks it all up and then when the right. copper goes in it's not altering any of the the, the magnetics of the earth so it just slides right in and then you're also replenishing it, like you just said, you're replenishing it with copper, which is very yeah. beneficial versus when you're putting all that iron. It's interesting because if you go to the hardware store and you look at a lot of like the uh, the, the, the bottled products that they sell, a lot of the poisonous products that they sell, a lot mm -hmm. of them are all very high in iron. So they know iron. what they're selling you, point. right? They know what they're giving you. They're low in copper, high in iron. And that's because it's blocking up all the root system too, right? Because if you think about it, it's interesting because like iron, I was redoing some research. Iron is the only thing that mercury won't take over. And that oh, wow. kind of made me think about some stuff to go, huh, that's, you know, that's interesting. Right. All the other metals, mercury will eat it. But iron, for some reason, it won't eat it. Not iron. Yeah. It's the it's one that they, uh, really? Magali, Magali, Magali. I did not know that. that yeah. Word. That's something new I've learned. Thanks. I, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, and I was thinking about those, um, you know, the antennas that they used to do, right? Those brass antennas on top of those buildings, and some of them did have mercury in them. But then maybe what it was was a layer, right? They're using all the elements at the same time, which is what we're doing with electrical. They're using the elements. But I think at, maybe they could have had iron in the inside, mercury in the bowl, and then brass on the outside, and then copper through the spire. Right. So you had all the different elements as it would use in alchemy. Right. And then as the sun would hit it and heat it up, it would create a gas. And then that gas could like it's, it's all this. Yeah, it's like all interesting. This, I think of all these things related to like a stack uh, battery too. like that makes sense. Mm. Well, that's part of it. Actually, electroculture kind of act. There's a galvanized uh, mechanism that happens in there between the different metals when you're putting it together and running that line down the post. That's why when you put it up 25 feet, you're you're grabbing the potential that's in the air. I believe it's every three meters, it's 100 volts. So, yep. Yep. yeah, yep. Yep. for 25 feet, it's it's interesting. I love it. I love it. And it's, it's, <laughs> all, been, it's all been shown. You know, they did all this. If, if you look in the patents, atmospheric energy, like I said, they used to send balloons up in the air and collect the energy. Yep. You know, so it's like, why don't we just do this and then help our plants and then also help heal ourselves too, right? Because mm. a lot of people have been messaging me and been telling me that their whole garden and house feels like a completely different, like like a sanctuary because of all the antennas they've placed. My buddy, for example, in Australia, he's got like probably 200 antennas in his backyard. And he said, when people come over, they're like, the energy is totally different in this area compared to like when they leave. And his dogs, uh, his name is Daniel, his dogs are always sitting next to the antennas and laying next to them at all times. They don't really? they're always sitting there, you know? So they know. My cats like so, to do experiments. Sorry, go ahead, Campbell. I was just going to say, so you, you can't overdo it by the sounds of it with, with antennas and stuff? Or I, I guess it's all experimental. I, it's, it is experimental, but I don't think you can really, you know, overdo it, so to say. It depends on how you ran it, right? Like if you covered everything in copper and your whole house is in copper, then I don't <laughs> copper think the best idea, you know, but I think everything in balance. But yeah, it's wild to see like just certain things and people getting like different pollinators they've never had before, right? Different types of yeah. butterflies. My buddy said he's got like a, a blue butterflies and or I'm sorry, not blue, blue, blue bees. I never even heard of a b blue bee before. Blue bees. Yeah, and he's actually in. He's. I. I talked to him yesterday on a, a, a podcast. He's in Australia, and he said he said he's got like blue bees flying around. So a lot of stuff that I think 
we wow. don't even know exists, right? Because what we've only been pictures caught. of these. Like that's huh? fascinating. Yeah, like we don't yeah. even know what's really out there, right? And I've had what? like even on my balcony, I've had praying mantises, you know, in in Arizona, which normally you don't see a praying mantis. Just you see scorpions, you know, you see snakes, but you don't see mantises. There's really no mantis here. Um, and then I've seen gigantic grasshoppers. I've seen, you know, you got birds, hawks, falcons, hummingbirds, sparrows. You know, all of them they under pick, they pick up on this stuff. The question is, is how many other species of things we don't even know can also pick up on that? Can, can I add to the antenna and how the energy flows? Of course. When I when I do uh, um, pulsing experiments on my workbench, and then I stop and I'll clear it off for the next experiment that I'm going to do, my cats will jump up on my workbench and go to sleep exactly where I've done the experiment every single time. So when you say that your friend has a bunch of antennas in the, in the yard, what I believe is happening is it's capturing the flow that's coming in and it's going straight through to the soil. So that area is the flow of energy that everybody's feeling. That's that's the amazing part. And the more antennas, the more flow. That's what my yeah. belief is. I don't know. I so agree with you on that one. Hmm. That's yeah, awesome. I mean, if, if if it's a tor, if if you know, if this place is a toroid, then that's the 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 movement, right? For bringing from the top into the ground and then back out again, kind of thing. So we're literally sitting in where the energy is, you know, like yep. flowing down into the earth and through them. Yeah, right. And Just like grounding your own multiple. energy, oh, though, right? Sorry. Like taking the uh, rubber off of your shoes, you got to ground, walk on natural earth. It's uh, mm -hmm. essentially grounding that uh, the earth even more so up. Changing yeah, that's an interesting. And they used to use copper, I mean, copper and brass a lot more in like shoes and belts and all this kind of stuff, didn't they? And now the same thing, it's all gone to metal and even um, utensils, right? They're now all stainless steel. I, I remember when I was young, I, I asked, you know, what, why are the royals called blue bloods? And I got told that. It's because they ate off silver silverware, like solid silverware, and, and it actually made their tongues go blue. So <laughs> I don't know if that's true. That's what I got told. But. Right? It's like I don't think it actually oxidizes like that. So. Yeah, I know. Right? Then it turns <laughs> Someone into had the, said a reptilian. The point, <laughs> if it oxidizes, you need the monoatomic. So that, that doesn't really make sense. Well, I can well, see that with the, uh, with the, the slugs. Slugs are bloods, right? And crap. And certain animals are blue blood. So it's interesting when you start putting yeah. rubber in your soil, the slugs all go away. They don't want to come and clean up the iron anymore. That's all being placed into it. So that's a that's an interesting one with them. And, the, and there was a guy who talked about that who studied Victor Schauberger, and he explained how the iron oxides are going through the soil, and then the slugs are going to pop up. And once you start placing copper in there, like, okay, the soil's good. I don't need to go there anymore. And then they go somewhere else. Oh, so I, yeah, I, okay, that's interesting. So basically, yeah, because we've got to look at this as, as a system, right? And so slugs and snails, we, we may hate them and think, oh, they're eating our plants, but actually they're there for a reason. We're, it's just that everything's out of balance. And so they're, they're, they're eating everything, right? That, that's interesting. That's very interesting considering what you use as slug bait to get rid of slugs on your, like if you're doing an outdoor and you have a bunch of plants that they're eating, well, it's copper sulfate, and they hate it. Yeah, they copper, turn around from it immediately. So that's copper interesting. Used to kill snails too, right? Like in uh, fish yep. tanks and whatnot. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. and, I, and the thing is, with that too, is I noticed with a lot of people because a lot of people always say, you know, I got bugs eating up my plants, you know, and whatever. Number one, the plants could be healthy, and they're eating them. But I've started to realize that, like you just said, the bugs are only coming around to clean everything up, right? They're, yeah. they're, they're trying to fix what, for example, let's say we are messing up. And yeah. that's why they're there to clean all that, you know, the, the, yeah. the plant that's already emitting frequencies. And uh, Philip Callahan had a, a great book on this, and I, I can't remember the name of it, but he basically described that plants will start emitting a UV frequency, or an, or an infrared frequency that the plant is now falling apart. And then the, the insects 
will actually see that frequency and then they will come and try to clean up that plant based on the color spectrum that that plant is emitting. Yep. I, wow. I, can, I definitely resonate with that. That's a, that's awesome. So, so basically if we have healthy plants, we shouldn't have, you know, pests or, you know, any of these things hanging around because they're literally there trying to fix things, but we're looking at them as the problem. And then we're, Yes. killing them with all this stuff more which is more chemicals which is making the problem worse yeah. it's crazy yeah. and then you keep back loops i was just going to say you keep damaging and then they keep coming back and then when you when let's say like there's some ants right and you smush them right you just let's say you smush them now it releases a pheromone which brings additional ants right more frequency yeah. and then you just keep going through this perpetual cycle and then you can't figure out why for example the bugs have taken over your land and then your land is so destroyed. So what do we do? Which we see now with our traditional farming practices, move to the next acre and keep just going to the next one and destroying that one <laughs> and going through these right. cycles, you know? And it's just, yeah, it's nuts. It, it doesn't make any sense and we don't need to do any of that. Um, Matt, have you ever worked with um, rock dust? Yes, the basalt, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, putting it in and turning it into the soil, it seems to help bring the soil back a lot quicker. Yes. Yeah. So what it what basalt is is that volcanic ash that comes out from the volcanoes, and it has lots and lots of quartz. So like for example, like this is uh, crypto quartz. It's a uh, it's the bloodstone, right? It's pure it's pure quartz, and oh, yeah. the the quartz in here when it's squeezed, right? So when I squeeze it like that, it creates that piezoelectric effect. So when you take, for example, basalt, if, if this was basalt or volcanic clay or quartz dust, as somebody just said, and you place that into your soil, as the earth is compressing that, right, as it's kind of pulling it down and the water and all those things are happening, then what's happening, it's creating that piezoelectric effect on the soil and then amplifying the energy. And then also providing the body, or not providing the body, but providing the plant with lots of quartz, lots of silica, Lots of beautiful rare earth metals, right? We use them in all these devices, but they're also put in. And then there's a lot of monatomics in the as well, which can be very healing as well, too. All right. And I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask uh, if you've uh, looked I have into a, that or applied that. Uh, I have a Matt, theory for that. Myself. I've uh, last year I used some monoatomic gold on a lettuce plant outside and it grew to six feet tall. And uh, <laughs> I showed that uh, in a couple of videos and just nuts. So, and I've seen lots of other people using this Ormus, the monoatomics alone, and that increases two to three X the yields in uh, the just vegetables, plants in general, too. So that if you're then connecting, electroculture with monoatomics and then the structured water that we could be looking at five to 10 X yields within uh, like just a couple years time and real abundance again. I mean, I could totally see that. And with the Ormus, you're putting it into a certain state, you're turning it almost into a colonial state. So it's yeah. very easy to absorb because you transmuted it through fire, right? We used to take things, burn them, turn them into ashes, and then pour them all over our plants. So your monatomics are, the, they've gone through the same process. They're hit at a super high heat. They go into a, you know, a different realm, as they say, mm. kind of come back. And then once they're back, they're put into a liquid, which is now a colonial liquid or a monatomic liquid. And then you place that onto your plants and they'll absorb it instantaneously. And a wow. lot of those monatomic elements are all conductive elements, which are needed mm. for the plant to function or for our brain to function. Yes. So the more you turn on that conductivity, like you just said, the more you're going to have. And there was one video I saw a long time ago with this guy. He started with like a vine plant and it was just like a little side of his house. And the vine took over his whole entire house when he started doing all these different practices. And they wow. won the world <laughs> record or Guinness world record for the largest vine because the average vine was like eight feet, basically. His grew to 2,000 feet. Whoa. Wow. So See, and, and my theory with monatomic elements, them being in the plant, we used all these different aspects, electroculture, structured water, uh, you name it. Uh, 
the amount of amount monatomics in the plants that would be for our bodies would be absolutely astounding because we don't get that now our soils are stripped of most of the elements and and like that's why i, I brought up rock to begin with because our soils are pretty much dead we're getting that way I mean. but yeah that's awesome awesome mm. And so, of course, if we if we do this, the plants that we grow are going to have more of what we need, right? So that by default, we, you know, we get healthier by making them healthier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what that's that's the biggest thing we're missing. Like the more I got into nutrition and healing, energy frequencies, energy healing, all of that, it's all your your cells are just not conducting, right? Your yeah. body is just not sending electric to the rest of the body. Exactly. Yeah. It's missing those vital nutrients to create electricity. And amplify yeah. your aura, your essence, your energy, you know, which is also mm. amplified during the full moon. So a lot of people have a lot of, you know, such stuff that goes with the brain during the full moon because the energy is so amplified. So if you have nutritional imbalances, those are amplified as well during the full moon, mm. you know. So when we start addressing electroculture and we start doing all these things for our soil and start bringing those things back, even like the basalt and the rock dust and these things, now you're addressing those mineral deficiencies that you didn't even know you had, right? And when I started getting into a lot of different, for example, superfoods, if you look at the materials that are in them, a lot of the people would say, you shouldn't eat that, right? It's, it's not, that's not what's supposed to go into the body. But then you look at the cultures who've been eating these things from these soils and these plants, and you see how healthy they are, then somebody's lying, right? That's kind of- <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Kids love to eat soil, don't they? They, they yeah. literally just eat the soil. There's pictures um, of me as a two-year-old eating soil, so <laughs> straight up, good point. And so to interact for Gurin, thank you for ten dollars Australian to me, and I also put ten dollars Australian on Campbell's channel. Oh. Greatly appreciate the support. We do, help. we do. Um, and yeah, because I was I was listening to someone the other day, and they were talking about health, and basically saying that the problem is that the inhibitors that is that we can't uptake certain things so you know you go to doctors and they're like i'll oh, take these vitamins take these pills and do all this stuff but if you can't uptake that into your body it's just it, it's a waste of time and money right so we need to work more on getting um, right. the inhibited like the inhibitors gone and so we can actually use everything that's coming just into like the body the sick plants and the bugs coming for them your body and your immune system and when you're a healthy immune system you never have to bugs. worry about anything any bugs anything like that and you take the chemicals the pharmaceuticals you're doing more damage more damage getting mm -hmm. yourself more out of uh, equilibrium yeah. out of uh, your field, your energies, everything out of balance, and your problems get worse. Well, it's interesting that we call like viruses and little things, you know, viruses, um, bugs, right? Oh, I just caught a bug. Yep. Yeah. I want to ask you, Matt, have you noticed mm. a big difference uh, eating electrocultured uh, gardens in comparison to, say, store bought produce? You'll notice That's a big difference the energy, so in, the, in the taste and the energy. Yeah, you don't need as much. You know, you'll you'll notice right. a big difference in the taste. I grow. I got a bunch of cayennes, which are growing like. I mean, I get like, I get cayennes every four days. You know, and it's not even wow. the season. It's it? it's still it's still seventy and sixty degrees outside. It's not even hot, but the bees just keep coming. They just keep you know whatever. And yeah. with that, the, the spiciness too. It's a lot more alive. Right. And, and wow. as Campbell was saying, like a lot of the stuff with the utensils and our plates and our cups. Right. Like we used to drink from copper cups. Right. We used to drink from uh, brass, cups, silver cups. We used to use a lot of stones, a lot of stoneware, a lot of different materials that were derived from certain things. Those would also amplify the energy or not change the energy of the yeah. food. Right. Because like you could go and get food from your garden take it inside, cut it, right? And now you just diminished the life force of it using, for example, the iron or the steel it's, and whatever. Yes. Versus back in the day, they used to pick, for example, basil. And I've seen this happen, and this is why I say this. Uh, you can go and pick basil with your hands, and you can pull it apart, and you'll notice that it'll pretty much just stay in the same composition, and it'll start to move, right? 
But if you take a knife and you actually cut it, you'll start to see it almost wilt. And you can yeah. see it with basil. It's one of the few plants I think you can see it with. But think about that on the energy spectrum, right? If you're growing all this beautiful stuff and then you now diminish the energy as soon as you bring it in the home, right? Then the flavor is going to change. Things are going to change. All these things. And as somebody just said, eating with the fingers was the original way. You look at a lot of people in, in different places, they ate with their hands. Right? Mm. That was all about it. Why? Because the, their hands are the neutral frequency. And then depending on whatever jewelry they were wearing at that same time, right? Let's say copper or whatever it may be, that also is helping the energy of that food while they're eating it at the same time. Mm. So it's all that energetic principle part that we just kind of have forgotten because we think, you know, oh, it's, it's just it's just food. And if we lost in touch with energy, like you were saying, the nutrition is not going to be the same. The nutrients, the flavor, the everything, the love that's being poured in there is not going to be the same. And it was interesting because when I was looking at all this research, there was a guy who talked about how plants can read your mind, right? Marcel Vogel talked about how plants can read yes. them. So if you're about to cause harm to them, they're actually going to get and kind of like release, not release a toxin, but they're going to get into a scared state and then they're going to pull the nutrients out just before they give them to you, right? Before you go to take it. So everything is very alive and conscious, much more than we're aware of. And yeah, I've noticed just a tremendous, there's just a different, just a taste, flavor, spice, you know, all these things that are supposed to uh, be tasted on the taste buds, right? Those things have all right. been dropped off. Mm. That's so, awesome. Clive Barkley you, with the, go sorry, ahead. you go. No, no you, you go. go ahead. You, I know <laughs> I was just, so I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, have you found or noticed um, that you need to eat less of this food because it's more nutrient dense? Because, you know, we're, we're in a society where people are just overeating it, but it's because what they're eating isn't satisfying them, right? It's not giving them what they need. So they try and take in more. So because these are more, you know, nutrient rich or whatever we want to say, do you find that? you need less of that food? I could say that that can be true on multiple levels. It's the same thing with water as well, too. Yep. Right? You have yeah, exactly. Water. You don't need yep. as much of it because it's, it's, it's hydrate. It's yeah, hydrogen. You can absorb it. Yeah. So same with the food. If the food, you know, if the food didn't, let's just make an easy scenario, travel 2000 miles to a grocery store, sit underneath lights that are cooking it with radiation and altering the frequencies and all of these things. I mean, by the time you're going to get it, how many nutrients are in it? And the reason I say this was there was a great book by Dr. John Ott, which was called Health and Light. And he learned that when lights were, when, when food was placed underneath fluorescent bulbs, the mineral content of those foods, such as like, let's say raw milk, was diminished by 75%. Wow. Right? wow. So think of every grocery store, they all got LEDs now, which is pretty much the same thing. But, you know, they, they have that. And then what's happening as it's sitting there, it's diminishing that life force before it's even brought to you. And then, yes, you're going to have to eat, you know, I don't know, 10 apples to try to get that nutrient uh, profile that you're trying to bring into your body. And then by that time, you know, it's also putting a big hole in your pocket because you're mm. trying to get those nutrients that your body is craving and trying to, you know, repair and restore. That's, I mean, this whole organic thing, right? Everyone's going organic, organic. And I went to an organic shop, um, was it yesterday or the day before? And, and <laughs> holy crap, man, they wanted five bucks for one orange. And they, they, they weren't, and the oranges weren't orange. Like, you know, they're sort of these uh -huh. off yellow. And I was just thinking, you know, everyone's into organic, but is, is that even. Is it, it organic? Half the it, organics have GMO in it. And they're like, oh, there was no pesticides, but it's still organic. But it's like. But what does organic even, even mean, really? I mean, what's non organic? I mean, non organic means not from Earth, right? I mean, pretty sure all the food's from Earth. But I mean, we seem to be going down one one sort of path that they're pushing. It's, and, and they love to push molecules, right? Balls. Everything's a molecule. Everything's, yeah. you know, this. it's no fields. The ether doesn't exist. There's no fields just molecules right little balls um which is you know this whole um organic and, and but clearly it look it looks like if you, you just need to grow food and just have the right fields and frequencies around and then you get the ultimate food rather than i mean what even is organic we don't even know do we really it's just a label 
Well, and that's and that's the thing is, you know, sometimes these labels get messed with, right? And I've seen that a lot with the meat, right? A lot of the meats are getting messed with, you know, where they're allowing things into the meat that people don't know are going into the meat. And yep. they are hiding Definitely. in their little loopholes, like you said, that are being placed in there so that they can maybe permit something, you know, or whatever. Or, for example, there could be, you know, I've seen things where, you know, I mean, organic has changed our lives. Like we went all organic and it just, I mean, my whole health changed and I can, my whole story is pretty much from that. But in general, there are certain loopholes which are now being added in because that movement has also grown so large. Right now they know, oh, everybody's going towards it. You know, we're going to have to change maybe some things and people should be aware of this. Like it might not be the same as say five years ago. And like you said, when we start growing all our own food, we can also give food to each other and then also help feed all the animals who are also needing food. Right. Because I get a lot of messages where they're like, I got deers eating my food and everybody. The reason being the deers need food, too. You know, so if we yeah. have abundance, then we can all give that out to each other and then create those, like you said, those energetic communities. And that mm. can be done very easily. It's 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 not a challenge. But yeah, the biggest thing is people are just like you said, they're just suffering from nutrient deficiency because yeah. there's so much bait and switch stuff going on. Right. Mm. That's how I see it. You're sold this, but then you get it and you're like, wait a minute, that's not even the color that's it's supposed to be. Right? I know what an orange mm. It's orange, you know, so yeah. and, if, and then if we think of the energetic principle of that, if the color is not there yet. Right. And it hasn't ripened. Well, are all the nutrients in there, too? Right. Because it's not ripe yet. So it's actually yeah. not the time to eat it yet. And nature's trying to show you these are green. So don't touch them. You know, so now we're kind of picking and choosing when we're going to bring that energy into our body. And that might not be doing the same and benefits. And that, that's all got to do with, you know, transportation and shipping and all this kind of stuff, isn't it? You know, like if we were picking it from a tree, you would never pick anything that wasn't ripe. I mean, clearly. Um, but yeah, organic. So organic is basically, far, you know, it started off farming without any chemicals, right? Fertilizer, all this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, who know, now that it's an industry, obviously big business are like, oh, we want a bit of that. But they don't actually want to grow organic, do they? Because it doesn't fit their model. So we do have to be yeah. careful. I believe for the most part, uh, like up here in Canada, organic means no pesticides, no herbicides. But realistically, but if they're still using fertilizers fertilizer. that, you know, is it really organic? You want to use natural stuff like bat guano and bone meal and blood meal. That's as, as organic as you can get. You know, and well, but, yeah, I mean, when I was young, like blood and bone used to be the only fertilizer that, that I really knew about. Right? That reminds me of Steiner prep, right? All his stuff, too. He did that with yep. the bones and the and the bullhorns when he put the bullhorns into the earth yeah. and then did the manure and the quartz, which once again, PZO electric effect. Yep. But, you know, same thing. They used to put those bullhorns into the earth and stuff them with manure and quartz. Yeah, I've heard they, this into the earth and that would amplify the energetic field for the upcoming season right because mm -hmm. after it went through its that that process from fall winter spring right and all of those seasons then that energy would be amplified for that area so yeah same thing we used to use a lot of natural ways and, and things that are just abundant right like yep. for example the manure thing exactly. obviously you have animals there is manure you know so that went with that but a lot mm. of that place like you know as 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 we were just talking about you know with toxic things that don't yeah. fit the narrative but also then keep the narrative of the sickness going right and then each one is all owned under the same umbrella so they're trying to keep that mission going because they're getting a kickback from every part of the, the division mm. yeah i mean abundance seems to you know, that would kind of fix everything, wouldn't it, really? I, I heard this story the other day about these farmers in Africa and one had a, a crop of corn or something and um, the elephants were coming, you know, to try and get his thing and he'd run out with a shotgun and be shooting up and trying to scare them away and they came back the next day and basically just trampled his whole crop, just destroyed it. And then a farmer down the road, she would actually put food out for the elephants and they would come along, they would eat the food, and they wouldn't touch her crops, and they'd go off. Because, and this is the thing, like one one 
you know, mindset is abundance. Well, I've got enough to feed the elephants too. One is, no, I don't have enough. I need to protect what I've got. But so if everyone just had more than they needed, that would just solve so many things. And, and obviously food is is the main the main thing, right? I mean, we have this thing called poverty, you know. I mean, all this can be fixed. Once you've got your food done, then you're healthy, you're fit, you're strong, you can get out and you can do things, you can build things. So it all really does start with with food security, which is what they've taken away from us, right? That's, I mean, that's the, the biggest ones, right? I, I, I've, I've realized if we just took, put a, took care of food and water, right? You had yeah. primary water, structured water, that's free coming out of the earth. And then you have, you have all the food. You're pretty much, you're pretty much set. You can figure out the energy. The energy is not yeah. even a difficult one at that point because you already have your food and your water to keep you alive. So, you yeah. know, those, those, those two things, just eliminating those, or at least restoring those, I should say, yeah, you can fix everything overnight. And the thing is, is that's why I realized they never do any of that to fix this or anything, because they just want to keep us in this perpetual cycle so that yes. we just keep coming back for more. And then like you, well, like we said at the beginning of this uh, podcast, is that, you know, the eggs go from, let's say, $3 to $10 to $20. And then they just keep playing games. But it's like it's there's still the same amount of eggs. There's no yeah, difference. Yeah, yeah. You know? Like there's no there's no eggs running out. They're still coming in. And yeah. it was interesting. I did a video. This was like six months ago or like uh, when all the shortages were occurring. And it was interesting because a lot of the shortages were occurring because they were holding the stuff in the warehouses and not releasing it to the public. And then three months later in the summertime, they did a sale. This was Amazon, yeah. Walmart, Target, all the big brands. They did a big sale, a blowout sale, because they had too much inventory. So then they put it all on sale after after they claimed we were all running out of everything. Yep. Yeah, it's a big scam. They just give us a story, and if we believe it, then we create it for them. I mean, this yeah. is this is what's been going on for so long. They try and um, build scarcity so that we buy their products. That's basically what it is. It is. It. I watched a, a um, doco last night, living on a dollar a day. And it was just, you know, and it was about poverty, obviously, and these people, but the same thing, like, and they were in Guatemala, right? They were in the tropics, but they were so, you know, sort of um, programmed that they were, they were going to the shop, you know, they were going and working on other people's farm to get their dollar a day and then going and spending that at a shop to buy food rather than growing their own food, you know? But the thing is, is because they were so undernourished and, and, you know, they didn't have enough food, they, they couldn't get out and do stuff. Literally, they couldn't go out and build businesses or, or build new houses because they they didn't have the energy, you know. So it, it really does all start with, with food, you know. If you've got the energy, you can go and do what, what what's needed to be done. Speaking of which, <clears throat> sorry, I finally found the video on the Alien Scientist channel where I show my six-foot lettuce uh, there. And oh, it right. literally provided like 10 different salads throughout the summer. That's why it's so, so uh, bare on the stalk, but it's because my dad kept picking leaves off of it. And you can see it's right in the middle there. It's as tall as the sunflowers. Yep. And like, that's, with this technology, abundance is coming and their fake scarcity no more. And like, I agree. they've been covering it up for far, far too long. And Matt, I've got questions for your own experiments and usage. I saw some that you had coils uh, around it and whatnot. What are you doing this year? And are you putting uh, electrical current in or just antenna ether uh, and energy and like nothing off the grid? Yeah, just at the moment, it's just all antennas using, for example, quartz. I've been doing a lot of experiment experiments with quartz and like wrapping quartz because yeah. it creates that piezoelectric effect and that seems to amplify it. Uh, the basalt situation, the bird sounds things I've done as well too, putting out like a lot of flaxseed. So the birds come around, right? Cause birds love flaxseed. They, they will they will come from all over. And depending on the color of the flaxseed, they will actually come more, right? Like for wow. example, if it's like a certain golden, golden flax, they will come from miles away I've seen. First, if it's a brown flax, they won't even touch it. And it's interesting because wow. I think that goes into the color spectrum in which they can see and they can pick up on from certain things. But yeah, just traditional. Farm. 
and we're this working is a windy on farm this. campbell's move too too yeah it is a bit windy <laughs> can you hear it <laughs> well we're doing some i'm doing some stuff with uh, a couple people where they're doing some larger scale uh, different different types of experiments to see how for example on a large area how much they can amplify and my buddy sent me a message already he started all of this only like i mean like two weeks ago or whatever it was April, uh, march 11th actually he told me so it was march 11th and he's already got radishes in by since march 11th and all of his stuff is just going crazy and he's doing it now on a large scale where he built a gigantic antenna that's probably about 20 to 30 maybe about 30 feet tall and it's got all the different types of copper coming out of it. And then he ran the copper through the ground to create a grid, right? Like the crop circles, same exact thing. Yep. And then now he's covering a very large spectrum of, of space at the same time. And we're going to kind of see what happens with that. But he's already getting stuff that he's like, I don't even get this in, in months. And it's already happening in three weeks, you know. And yeah, wow. that's what I'm kind of working on. Trying to figure out how we can amplify and then... Also, like which which stones, right? Like, let's say we talk about like magnetite or we talk about like lapis lazuli, right? All the different stones that there are. This one, magnetite is the, the magnet in which they used to make the compasses out of, right? When they used to make compasses, they would put some magnetite in there or they would make dousing rods. They would put magnetite in there because it picks up on the magnetic north. And then the other one is lapis lazuli, which has the copper in it, right? The blue, you got the copper in there as well. But this one has a lot of sulfur and is very conductive, right? If you strike, for example, this stone against this stone, you can actually create a fire. It's very, very conductive. But we've had a couple people who've experimented putting the lapis lazuli on their coil and their plant exploded in a short amount of time. So I think each stone, each crystal, right, also emanates and creates different types of frequencies and things like that. And it's just kind of understanding, okay, which one should I be using, right, for the color spectrum that I may be in need, right? When we look at all the stuff that's going on in the sky, what are they doing? They're blocking the sun, the color spectrum of the sun. So when we start putting all these beautiful colors back in there, we're actually bringing back the color spectrum into the, the, the plants too. But copper is the same reflective color. If you hit this with the sun, you'll get a hue. You'll get like a big circle around it of that golden hue of, for example, the sunset and sunrise. So think of it as giving also your plants certain colors. And this is what I've been experimenting. Oh, I never with. thought of that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you're trying to, like, so think of your lights. You know, they're only giving certain spectrums based on the light. But now mm -hmm. what you're doing is giving the spectrum it needs, right? So certain stones and certain materials can also emanate certain colors and spectrums. So we're putting it into like that. That's kind of what I've been messing around with. So I guess that's, yeah. the, that's the best way to describe my experiments. That's awesome, brother. That's a golden nugget right there, Matt. Golden nugget, I'm telling you. <laughs> I love it. So we've been going an hour and fifteen. So what if if people obviously everyone does? I'm watching this. Does want to start electro culture because this is what we need, right? We need lots of food and abundance. So. What's the best way to get started? You were sort of just mentioning um, gemstones and before you mentioned quartz and all this kind of stuff. Are they built into the antennas? Like if you if people want to get started, what would what would you tell them? If they wanted to get started, the simplest way. I don't know what that is. Oh, am I frozen? It's all good. Oh, the simplest way would frozen. be just a piece of wood with ah. copper and then yep. just wrapped and placed into the earth. That would be the easiest way. But we have a part on our website, which just has tons of information on this. It's cultivateelevate.com slash electroculture. And I actually redid the blog that you guys posted up before because I noticed that it was, it was all messed up. Easier frozen. <laughs> but um, I redid everything on that, on that blog so that there's more information, better diagrams, better images, better videos, and then just more frequently asked questions because a lot of people – are trying to figure out, you know, can I use pennies? What type of materials should I use? Should I use a copper pipe? You know, should we use like the base salt? Can I do this with hydroponics? So it kind of covers all of those different spectrums and different nice. you know, frequently asked questions so that people can really take an initiative and just try it out and see what happens. 
Awesome. Highly recommended website. Highly recommended. I love that. Um, I got a question for you, Matt. You had mentioned earlier your, your friend is doing a large scale, and he had run the copper wire from his antenna down into the dirt. He used copper wire rather than galvanized for the uh, the dirt antenna, so to speak? Yes. So he ran copper throughout the whole entire, the, the all of the land, and okay. he basically created this big, large-scale antenna, and he aimed it out kind of like a tease. Think of like tease, you know? And so yeah. it's like a big, tall one with like arms kind of hanging out like that, and it's just going up into the air. And then he ran that copper into the soil through the earth, and then made it like a grid into his dirt. Or That's into- awesome. That's awesome. Because I use galvanized wire for my north end to go into the dirt. But I, I'm going to be trying the copper wire outdoor. That's just my indoor setup. So thank you. Yeah, try it out and just, you know, work, test different materials. You know, I guess that's the best way to describe it. Test and see what works. You know, and everybody's land is different, right? Somebody might use different types of materials based on their land, right? That's another thing that's kind of forgotten. You know, certain land is going to require certain things and everybody is at different points. You know, I'm here, for example, in Arizona and the soil is a little bit different than, for example, if I go farther north, it's a different type of soil. So it might depend on what you're working with, but yeah, try it out and see what happens. Awesome. Nice. So, um, yeah, basically, yeah. So if people want to get this started, get some copper, get a few things. And, I mean, I suppose if your soil, if there's a lot of quartz around your area, you probably don't need to put quartz in and things like this. So that sort of, would, would you think? So that's kind of how you need to look at your own land and just try things, I guess, see what happens. But also if you're doing this, guys, which you all are going to do, um, you know, record your results and let everyone know what does work and what doesn't because, you know, with – with social media, right, we can get this sorted out very, very quickly, right? And it literally might be, you know, use this stone for green leafy vegetables and this for tomatoes. You know, we just don't know, but all this has got to be sorted out. So definitely let us know. And as we're seeing now, this is um, Matt's channel, Cultivate Elevate. The link is below in the description. And is your website cultivateelevate.com? Yeah, yes. I post yes. right here, right? And yep. I posted this link in that's the, the one there as well for everyone and you're so, also on instagram is that right yeah we're on instagram we have our two pages we have cultivate elevate and then cultivate elevate two is our backup page which has actually surpassed our original page now <laughs> <That's Yeah. it. laughs> gotta love censorship <laughs> it's just you know i i realize it's they will censor you now they censor electroculture videos too as well right like they're, wow. they're obviously because People are starting a movement. I've seen so many things happen. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's funny if you look at the electroculture hashtag on like, for example, TikTok, right? It's at 17 or 18 million views. Wow. It was was at 1,000 views when I put up my first video of a copper with a piece of wood and an antenna, right? So to see that and all the people and the thing you just said too, record Make videos, show, do experiments, get creative because that that's what's needed because we can't just do this one person at a time. We need to do it as a, you know, as a- The grand a, awakening. Yes, yes. We're all here talking from all different points. Everybody should mm. be doing that. And, that's, and we're going to have you back, Matt, for several more and even- <laughs> Whether you like it or not. We should try for once a month even so that we can each share all of our results from our electroculture gardenings because I'm Absolutely. also going to be doing some here. Gerald's doing some, you're doing some, but then also diving into the Tartaria, the Antiquitech, all of that, which we've uh, researched a little bit more, but you also now are getting into and making a lot more sense of it. So uh, we can start applying that in experiments too. And uh, mm. absolutely mm-hmm. awesome work you're doing, sir. Mm. Well, and that's the thing. Mm. I was going to say what Campbell was saying is with the stones too. Remember the dolmens, they used to stack the stones on top of each other. And that yep. created an effect, right? So I even thought if someone took rocks from their backyard, stacked them on top of each other, depending on what the material is, right? Yep. They could be creating energy too. 
We have no uh, idea what anything does. Basically, I've realized we have no, we're very no. <laughs> we know it's dropping the bucket. It's all fields, and we've been taught. We haven't even taught about fields, right? But, but clearly, everything is fields and interacting fields. So. We, we need to sort of start looking at, at things, start, stop listening and start, you know, doing more experiments, I think. But the main thing I, I also I wanted to say is, you know, this is so easy. There's not much to this, right? It's, it's getting seeds, some metals, some rocks, doing some experiments. But these little, you know, fairly s simple seeming acts, this could change everything. Like literally, if, there's, if they've got no food to sell us, no chemicals, fertilizers, I mean... That would take down so many industries, right, that are all built to repress us. Like this is such a simple solution to, to literally create so much change so quickly and so easily and so cheaply. Like it's so, um, yeah, I'm just yeah really glad that you're out there doing your work and that I came across it and it, it links in perfectly with everything we've been doing and the whole Tartari, this whole sort of journey i guess we've been on for the last kind of three or four years working out that everything's just a lie and and that we actually do we did know how to do all this stuff we've just got to get back and and listen Start to ourselves and do some experiments and do it again yeah. right and Cam, you're, you're now on a farm in australia so uh what a perfect first episode for being on kelly's farm and but the next time Matt's on, we better see some antennas plugged into the yeah. ground out there, mister. Oh, yeah. Yep. Maybe I've build, yourself, and maybe build yourself a dome. I, I wanted to get back to that a little bit. Did you know? I don't know if any of you guys have seen that documentary. They were pulling apart uh, one of them in England, and they they took a breakdown of the materials, and it turns out it Brace. all the materials that were contained in it acted as an earth battery. Yep. So very interesting tech. It, it could go along with electroculture or even antiquitech, like you were talking about with the balls on top of the homes. They could have been pulling electricity in, collecting it through electrostatic motors or whatever other mechanism they're using, as well as the electroculture on top of that. And that, that just blows my mind. So thank you for your work, Matt. Just wanted to bring that up. No, I like that. And, and you're, you're spot on with that. I saw a guy in New York who showed two stones stacked on top of each other and they were seeing all these orbs all over the place. And they were yep. like, Oh, it's haunted. That's what they were telling them. But mm -hmm. what they were, they didn't realize what, it, when they showed with this device, that what was actually being seen, it was the, the response coming from the rocks. It was creating yep. the piezoelectric effect, which was making these orbs all over the place. And yeah, I mean, think of that energy if you harnessed it, or you put it below the earth and you kept it as a battery and you and you turned it into a little battery down there, you could have a ton of energy all the time and you could always kind of shoot it out whenever you needed it, right? Because that's kind of how yep. it would work. And it's like, yeah, we could be doing all of that. And they did do that, right? Like related to Tartaria and all of that. They understood all that. You know, they weren't building these beautiful buildings for fun. You know, they were they understood all of their architecture and the materials that went into them and the crystals and the stones and the gold and the mercury and all those other things that we do. Absolutely. Here's a dolmen in Montana, they, they say, and look at how tall it is. Is that essentially what you're describing, that it's more of an antenna reaching up? And that trees, was that why they're growing up? Because then into the roots, into the ground, that uh, that's probably natural electroculture and just how these plants move all on their own. And the pyramids, oops, the pyramids, how quickly they all get overgrown. And that a lot of the times yeah. South America, oh, am I going to get the right pictures? Now it never works out when you're live. Uh, <laughs> Here we go, right? Just how quickly they overgrew. And then uh, in uh, Peru and South Africa, all of the mountains of uh, terraformed terraces that uh, are made out of these megaliths going up the mountains, essentially mm -hmm. that could also be a type of uh, electroculture purposes that they did it for. Well, and look at it like the one you just showed in the picture. There's all the different emblems, the, the sacred geometry, right? So now imagine in you the take garden. that sacred geometry, and now you compress 
that sacred geometry, right? So now you would change that field based on the image that's on the stone. And then that compression that's occurring is obviously creating that, like you just said, that field. And then all of those, like you just said, those pyramids are all covered in plants, right? Because the plants are, are, are growing like wild. And interestingly enough, the one you just showed where it's like two, two, and then the one stacked on top of each other, that pressure is creating a ton of energy, right? A oh. ton of energy. Like you have a, a physioelectric stack. power on the crystal. Exactly. At the top of it. Yeah, absolutely. Not genius. And it just, you know, when we look at that, it's like that, that would, you know, it, the compression would make sense. It's, it's, I mean, look at how heavy that stone is. Like even this one you're showing right here, this is probably like a, I don't know, 20 ton stone on top of some other 20 ton stones, but exactly. think of 20 tons pressing down. And then if that's all quartz, that piezoelectric effect, it's gotta be, you know, I mean, just yep. massive. And, and right? You can wow. add to it one more, one more time as it's pressing down with that piezoelectric effect and it starts to rain. It's like a whole bunch of little pulses one after the other, which just adds to the energy. Yep. Or yep. atmospheric changes. Like when you yep. have the pressure change high and low and storms come in, right? Then you, then you have all that and lightning and all of, you know, all the beautiful mother nature. Absolutely. The yeah, those were, too. Those were all horse and wagon. That's what it was. Horse and wagon, you know, <laughs> <laughs> horse and wagon. That's what it was. <laughs> We're gonna prove this summer what it were, how it was. And really copper built. chisel, right? Yes, Don't yes, use copper yes. in your garden. It, it yes. was used to make all of these insane buildings. Yes, they With rock hammers, right? right? Hammering around, you know, hammering yeah. around. Yeah, man. Enough time, enough people. You can build anything, even if you don't know what you're doing. Ten million of them, yeah. Ten million of them. Yeah. <laughs> All righty, so there we go, we're at the hour and a half mark. So we are going to um, sort of leave this one here. But, yeah, like Bernie said, we'd love to have you back for another chat. And, and you know, maybe, yeah, it might turn into sort of a monthly update. Um, I've obviously got lots of work to do around me. Um, we're doing a market garden and everything, so I'm definitely going to be getting into it. Um, and, like, um, anyone who else is doing it, um, you know, make a short video and send it in, you know, and we can sort of show them in, in the um, – in the lives and everything yeah, and, and let's exactly get this going exactly. i mean this is so simple and easy let's just let's just do this exactly like and i've got uh, in my real science series that gerald is a regular weekly member on and uh we're already, he's already on his channel showing a lot of it and that uh, we're going to be doing these monthly and bi-weekly agricultural oh, yes. electroculture episodes as it is I uh, I'll have to grab your email, Matt, as well, and uh, try to do as much collaboration and knowledge sharing as possible and discovery as yeah. that's what this great awakening is all about and bringing back abundance everywhere, healthy life, uh, happy life, and the ability to give, grow, and live in harmony oh, yeah. instead yep. of this destructive scarcity uh, murderous insanity that uh, they try to apply on us and make mm. us apply on ourselves no more. So I, I'm reading. I'm reading Justin Christoflo's book right now uh, on my channel, all 586 pages. So it's it's uh, taking a little while, but uh, I, I hope that you're wrong when it comes to them kicking it off YouTube because it's gonna be a long series. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no, let's go. Be, Rumble, Odyssey. There's other platforms. Be, oh, yeah. You can put it on every platform, and I'm sure it'll all work out. I was saying that with related to like things on TikTok and some stuff with Instagram. Right. You know, they're right. doing stuff with that. Facebook, especially, obviously. You know, yeah. but once again, there's so many platforms. You know, there's so many ways, and that's the magic of it all. You know, I mean, that's that's what yeah. we have in our advantage. Then we have the ability to connect on so many different levels now. Yeah. Oh, Cam, you, you've been un, you unselected by Rumble. I was like, oh, I, uh, I did I? we are live on Rumble. And then uh, I went Did I? Oh, it. shit. I thought I I hit something and then I went, what? How come mine's still there? I thought I deleted mine. Clip, we sorry. now are live on Rumble <laughs> for all of 30 seconds. Uh, unless, you know, you want to do a little bonus on Rumble. But probably can't because I got Benjamin Balderson, Odin's Alchemy coming up. Um, 
Gerald, if you're free and want to join us, by all means. Uh, Matt, you're welcome to, but it sounds like you're a very busy guy. But uh, if you want, I can post the link as well. Uh, if you want to come on uh, there in about a half hour too. Uh, no, any sorry. last words from all of you? There's me rooster. All right, I've got to go off and build a roost, some rooster roosts, some <laughs> chicken roosts. So um, awesome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, 380 of you still here. We cracked the 400 mark. So thank you all. Um, yeah, hope you all get out there and, and, and you know, use this information practically. Get out there, grow, tell your friends, show them your results. Um, like I said, you know, let us know, take videos, all that stuff. Shut up, your rooster. And we will keep going down this track of abundance. Um, as like I said, we, we already have all the answers. We just got to put them into, um, you know, into fruition. It's on you, it's <laughs> over. It's over, that's what it is. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> Indeed. Totally wake up. All right, well, learn, uh, Bernie, I've, I'm on my computer, so I'll let you play the outro because I don't have them. Um, thank you. Yeah, and we'll catch you all on the next upload. Thank you for Matt. Thank you for, for joining us and Gerald, and we'll talk to you all soon. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you for having me. Much love. Thanks again, Matt. Ta ta.